All right, so good time Easter to remember the death, burial, and resurrection. It's always great reading through um, the Gospels, being reminded what Jesus went through for us. Today I'm going to be preaching on the resurrection of Christ, just a few thoughts on Easter. But I want to go through, uh, you know, the resurrection of Christ really is one of the main fundamentals of the faith. Uh, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ be not risen, then our faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. But not only that, the resurrection is one of the strongest arguments for Christianity in terms of, you know, I'm going to go through the different, th the, the facts of the resurrection. And then I'm going to go through as well some of the theories that people try and use to explain away the resurrection and how they come uh, very short. And really the most reasonable explanation for the facts around Jesus is that he truly is the Son of God that rose again from the dead. But before I get into that, I just want to give some thoughts on Easter. Uh, Easter is when we, re when we remember uh, the death, burial, and resurrection. I don't know whether Easter is really the best term for uh, what we celebrate, because really we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Easter is just another word for Passover. So we don't really celebrate the Passover. You know, we don't sacrifice a lamb and do the days of unleavened bread and uh, put leaven out of our house. So we're not really celebrating Passover, but we've come to know this holiday as Easter, where we remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ because it was all centered around the Passover, right? Because Jesus was the true Passover. And as we look just briefly at the timeline, it's interesting that when Jesus died, it was actually the day where they killed the lamb, Passover. So it's just amazing that, you know, all around, you know, Jerusalem, they're all slaughtering this lamb, you know, as the Passover lamb for their, for their sins, you know, remembering when the angel of death passed over them and the blood was applied on their doorposts. And at that very time where they're preparing, to, to, to kill, you know, killing the lamb in preparation for the Passover the next day, Jesus Christ is on the cross dying. How amazing is that? Um, I just think it's interesting that, you know, obviously the symbol of Christianity we know is the cross. And the cross, if you think about it, is a, is a, is a, uh, a, a death instrument. You know, Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, brutally nailed to the cross through his, through his hands, and hung there to die until they su either suffocated to death, and you see with the thieves, their legs were broken, and that's why they could no longer breathe, and that's what caused their death. And just one thing I find interesting about the cross is, you know, people wear this as jewellery. You know, people wear the cross as jewellery. You know, I'm not like the Jehovah's Witnesses that just think, oh, you know, you can't have any sort of symbols to remember things. But isn't it interesting that we see the cross as a symbol of love? Because let's say you wore this on your neck. You wore a guillotine on your neck or you, or you wore a noose on your neck. People would think, you know, are you some sort of sadistic person? But when you wear a cross on your neck, it's a symbol of love. Isn't that amazing that, you know, Jesus dying on the cross changed what this was. You know, the, the crucifixion was a symbol of you know, murderous, you know, torture, you know. Uh, not, sorry, not necessarily murder because they might have been guilty of death, but it was like, you know, a symbol of torture. But yet now we wear it and we remember what Jesus did for us. Um, you know, Christians tend to use a cross that doesn't have Jesus' body on there. Uh, you know, Catholics have Jesus' body on there. Um, I'm not too fussed about which one's right or wrong. Obviously, one remembers his sacrifice, his death. Uh, but the reason why the cross is empty when Christians have an empty cross is we remember that he is risen. And he did not remain on the cross. He came off the cross and he is risen again. So we look to the cross, an empty cross, knowing that our Saviour has risen. Um, now, some people believe Easter is a pagan holiday. I don't believe that's true. Uh, just because Ictor and Easter sounds the same, that doesn't mean that it's the, they're the same thing. But... Some people try and prove that it's a pagan holiday from Acts 12. Easter only appears one time in the Bible. Uh, and, and like I said, if, if you look at other English Bibles, older English Bibles, it appeared more times because really the word Easter was just an, a translation of the, English, uh, of, the, of the Greek word Pasha, right, for, for Passover. But when Tyndale translated the Bible, he, he coined the phrase Passover. So as more English Bibles were getting translated, that sort of phased out. Easter to Passover, but it was kept once in Acts 12, maybe for vocabulary's sake or whatnot. 
But in Acts 12, we read here now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. So this is where the church is getting persecuted, actually during the days of the Passover. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So like I said, I would interpret this passage because I know that Easter is just the English word for, for the Greek word for Passover. So we know that this is the same word, but people would say that Easter is something different because they'll say then were the days of unleavened bread and they think, well, if it was the Passover, the Passover came first, right? So you had the Passover, then the days, days of unleavened bread. So how could Peter be brought out after Easter if it was already the days of unleavened bread? That's the argument. So that's why people are saying, ah, Easter's actually a pagan holiday, and that's why the, you know, and obviously you shouldn't be celebrating Easter with the bunnies and the chocolate eggs and everything. That has nothing to do with Easter. But that's why people believe, you know, Christians, some people believe Christians shouldn't celebrate Easter because that has pagan origins. I don't believe so. I believe what this is saying is that the days of unleavened bread was Easter, was the Passover. And you say, well, wasn't the Passover the first day? And then you have the days of unleavened bread? No, because Passover actually, although you have the day of Passover, which when they ate the lamb, you also have Passover as the feast, which was the whole period. Uh, so they refer to the Passover as the whole period, including the preparation. That's why when the, when the, when the um, disciples ate the Last Supper, they said, now the Passover came. It's because that was actually the day of the preparation of the Passover. And even when they slaughtered the lamb, then they had the, when they ate the lamb on the actual Passover day, which was the first day of unleavened bread and then the seven days of unleavened bread. So we see in Luke 22 here, where we see the word Passover being referred to as the, the whole feast, right, of unleavened bread. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. So you not only have the Passover day, which was the first day before the seven days of unleavened bread, but you also had the term used for that whole feast, including the preparation. Um, that's what I believe about it anyway. Different people have different interpretations. That's what I believe about it. Now, another thing is I wanted to talk about at Easter is the era of Good Friday. You know, so some people say, you know, we celebrate Good Friday, which was the death of Jesus Christ. And then you have Easter Sunday, which was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is not actually biblical because we know from Jesus himself, he says, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So if you count from Friday to Sunday morning, Friday night to Sunday morning, you don't get a total of three days and three nights. So some people try and say, well, if you include Friday and include Sunday, you get three days. Yeah, but you don't get three days and three nights, right? You may get, I don't know whether it's like two, two, two nights and three days or something like that um, when you count it up. So it can't have happened from, uh, I think you only get like one day and two nights or two days and one night. So when you count it up, Jesus did not die on a Friday because he had to be three days and three nights in hell paying for our sins to fulfill the scripture just as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Now where does this idea of Jesus dying on a Friday come from? Well it's this misunderstanding that just because he died a day before a Sabbath people assume he died before the seventh day Sabbath on Saturday. So because they see in the scripture that he died the day before the Sabbath they assume that that's the seventh day Saturday, Sabbath Saturday, so they say he must have died on a Friday. But that's not the case because the first day of Passover was a Sabbath as well, as well as the first day of unleavened bread. So he actually died on the preparation of the, of the Passover. Then you have the Passover, then you have the first day of unleavened bread, and then you had the Saturday Sabbath. So it's just interesting that when Jesus was spending three days and three nights in the heart of the earth paying for our sins, there was actually three consecutive Sabbaths that were going on, you know, the Sabbath representing that when we rest from our works uh, and enter into the rest of Jesus Christ. So now when the even was come because it was the preparation, so I just want you to note there, you see the, the Bible is very clear actually that the day that Jesus died was on the preparation. Um, so this is the day following the Last Supper. That is the day before the Sabbath. So this is where people misunderstand this Sabbath being the seventh day Sabbath rather than the Sabbath of the Passover. 
Joseph is of Arimathea, and also that's when Joseph takes his body and buries him. I just wanted to show you where they get Friday from. So this is um, a timeline I put together. Now, different people have different timelines. This is my current understanding of the, of the timeline. I just want to show you how I understand it works. So we, we, we see morning and evening uh, on our calendar. We, we tend to say a, a day is a morning, then an evening. Whereas in the Bible, it's, it's, it's quite clear that evening comes first. If you see all the way in Genesis, the evening and the morning were the first day. So the Jewish calendar has a s switched, right, where they would have the evening first and then the morning. So the way I understand the, the day of events, this is the preparation. So you'd have the Last Supper prior to that in the evening when they ate together. And then that's when Jesus, you know, his, his trial goes throughout the night. And then he's, you know, all his suffering happens on the day. Uh, it would be Wednesday, right? Now, in the Bible, days start at 6 o'clock. So when you see the third hour of the day, that's 9 a.m. in the morning because the day starts at 6 a.m. Um, so when Christ died at the ninth hour, you remember at the ninth hour he cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Um, and I, I can't remember whether it was, I think it was the sixth hour is when it was darkness over the face of the earth. So the sixth hour, that would have been 12 um, uh, p.m., right? Uh, 12 p.m., so that would have been afternoon when the, when the uh, sun went dark uh, during the death, and at the ninth hour is when he died. So that would have been 3 o'clock. So this is when they killed the Passover lamb. So even though they killed the Passover lamb at even on the 14th day of the month Abib, at even, it was, it was just prior to even. So even though they say it was at even, they didn't kill it at 6 p.m. They killed it prior. That's why there was a preparation day. So that's when Jesus Christ died. And then remember, he was buried because they didn't want him to stay on the cross because they were celebrating the Passover. So he was taken off the cross. He was buried. So this is day one, evening and morning, which was the Passover. Day two was the first day of unleavened bread. So that's night two and day two. And then this was the seventh day Sabbath starts. So even though that's like Wednesday night for us, that would actually be the evening of Thursday day. That would be night three. And then Jesus would have risen again sometime, well, I believe, at, at even on the first day of the week. And then Sunday morning is when the ladies come early in the morning, remember, with spices. That's when the angel rolls away the stone and Jesus was already risen, right? So it's not that he rose when the stone was rolled away. He rose on the first day of the week. But when they came, that's when they found the tomb empty. So if we followed the Jewish way of doing days and nights, if we did evening and morning, it would look a bit like this, right? So let's say we put Thursday, Wednesday night to Thursday's actual day. You'll see that the Last Supper was happening the evening on Wednesday. Then Jesus died in the morning on Wednesday. And then you have the three days he was paying for our sins in hell. And you have the consecutive Sabbaths. Then he rose again Sunday evening and then the tomb was found empty. So that's, that's, that's my understanding of the timeline. But you do your own study. This is not what this sermon's about. But if you do your own study, you, you'll see, uh, well, hopefully you'll see it's the same. If not, then you'll have to correct me on this. <laughs> All right, Acts 2. Now, what makes Jesus' resurrection? Because today we're talking about the resurrection, right? What makes Jesus' resurrection different to other resurrections? Because you say, what's the big deal of Jesus rising again? When, if you've read your Bible, you know other people rise again from the dead, right? You know, you have Elisha raising people from the dead in the Old Testament. You have Jairus' daughter who was dead and raised again. And you also have Lazarus. Lazarus was the climax event, or besides, obviously besides the, 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 the crucifixion. Lazarus was the climax event in the book of John where Jesus, you know, even after Lazarus had been dead for multiple days, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And, Jesus, and Lazarus comes out, you know, bound in the clothes. Um, raised from the dead. So what made Jesus' resurrection different? Well, there's a couple of things I want you to think about. One is, Jesus was the only one that actually was raised from the dead. Like, truly was dead when he was raised again. Because everybody else, you know, is, I mean, obviously we, 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 we assume that those raised in the Bible were all saved people. They were either children or Lazarus was a saved believer. So he was sleeping. Even Jesus says about Lazarus, Lazarus sleepeth. So they were sleeping in the sense that they were dead physically, but their souls would have been in heaven with God. So they were just reunited with their body. 
So that's one difference, right? Jesus, the Bible says here, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So Jesus not only physically died, his soul descended into hell to pay for our sins, and he was raised out of hell. See, nobody else comes out of hell. Once you go to hell, you know, obviously there's the resurrection of damnation just to be thrown into the lake of fire, but nobody is raised again back to life from hell. So Jesus, when he says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He may have the keys of hell and of death. He truly was dead, physically and spiritually. That's one difference. Not only that is when he rose from the dead, he didn't come back to the same body, right? So when people were raised in the, in the Old Testament or the New Testament, they were raised back to life in the same sinful flesh. Whereas Jesus, when he rose again, he's the first begotten of the dead, given his new glorified body, right? So that's another difference. And the last difference is that Jesus actually was risen from the dead by his own power. Right? So when other people were risen from the dead, they were risen by the dead by God, whereas Jesus is God. He raised himself from the dead. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Now the resurrection, which is what I want to talk about mainly, and the different theories trying to explain away the resurrection, uh, we'll go through them and why they fall short. Uh, the resurrection really is a fundamental of the Christian faith. And we learn this in 1 Corinthians 15. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christianity is false. That's how crucial the resurrection is to Christianity. Christ the, the resurrection is what started Christianity. And without the resurrection, there would be no Christianity and, you know, it would all be vain. This is what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection from the dead? See, this is a heresy if people are teaching that there is no resurrection from the dead because if people don't rise from the dead, then Jesus didn't rise from the dead. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, look at this, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. See, we're preaching the gospel the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If there's no resurrection, then what's the point of Christianity if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? And your faith is also vain. You see, Christianity would not exist if Jesus didn't rise from the dead because there'd be no point for it. Because we are preaching hope that Jesus rose from the dead. That gives us hope. We're saved by that resurrection. Hope in the work of Jesus Christ that we will one day be raised again. We're given the first fruits first of the Spirit that then our bodies, like Jesus, will one day be resurrected and glorified and given a new body. Look, yay, and we have found false witnesses of God. See, Paul is saying, hey, we're preaching that Christ rose from the dead and he didn't. We're false witnesses because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you're yet in your sins. Right? You have no salvation without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Look at this. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. What is he saying there? Because we trust completely on Jesus Christ. See, people that believe in work salvation, you know, all the best to them, right? They're going to come short too. But they don't have their hope fully on Jesus Christ. Right? That's why they're not saved. But what he's saying here is, we do. <laughs> you know, as believers on Jesus Christ, we are fully trusting the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the more you trust, the harder you fall, right? And that's why he's saying is, hey, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable, because we're completely trusting that. If it's false, but it's not. Thank God. So, Whilst this is one of the fundamentals of the faith, I think it's interesting that you know, people argue for Christianity different ways, right? Um, you know, creation and evolution is a popular way people try and argue Christianity. But you notice with creation and evolution, you can, you can convince somebody of the, the, the reality of God, 
and the truth of God. But that doesn't mean that they believe the right God. So the resurrection really is what puts Jesus Christ apart from all the other different religions. Because if people ask me, like, what, what, what's, what makes Christianity different? Well, what makes Christianity different is Jesus. That's what makes it different. There's a man, Jesus, who claimed to be God in the flesh, the Son of God, and not only that, he died, was buried, and he rose again to prove it. Um, I like how David Wood puts it. David Wood says, you know, when somebody dies and rises from the dead, uh, rises from the dead, uh, he says, I have, I have a bad habit of believing people that rise from the dead. <laughs> so he's like, if somebody dies and rises from the dead, you better take heed to that person. Um, and really that's one of the main things that separates Jesus Christ from every other religious leader. Every other religious leader had sin. Every other religious leader died. Every other religious leader stayed dead. But Jesus didn't. Jesus died. He was buried. His tomb was empty. And his disciples went out preaching that they had seen the risen Jesus. So the question is, how do we explain that? How do we explain those things? Well, I'm going to go through six theories that people give to try and explain away the facts about Jesus. Hopefully that'll give you some solidity in your faith that we do not just believe in fairy tales you know our, what we believe is based on historical fact and really christianity is the best explanation of those facts and if somebody rejects christ as their savior does not believe on jesus christ then they need to come up with a better explanation of these historical facts and people have tried and they they come short you know they, they kind of live i believe in a delusion now one Thing that people say is that the story of Jesus Christ is just a myth. It's just made up stories and things like that. I don't know if you've ever heard that. You know, just people just, you know, they, they kind of liken, they try and explain away Jesus by just likening him, likening him to like, you know, myths and legends or dream time stories. And here's some things I say to that. This is really the longest point. So not all my points are this long. I just want to establish some things that it's rooted in historical fact. This is something interesting in Luke 3. In Luke 3, this is how Luke starts, Luke chapter 3. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, just note that name because that name will come up later as we look at a few historians. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituria and of the region of Trachonitis and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now let me ask you, if you were going to write a fairy tale, is that how you would start it? If you were going to write a fairy tale in today's day and age, would you say, you know, in 2019, uh, when, uh, who's the president? Donald Trump is the president of the United States, and... Who's the president of Australia? Who's the prime minister of Australia? Scott Morrison, right? Keeps changing so quick, I lose track of who's, who's prime minister. Scott Morrison, you know, being the prime minister of Australia and whatever. You know, you, you don't start a fairy tale by giving people actual historical figures and timelines, right? In the 15th year, that's not how you start a fairy tale. Because you know what? If you started a fairy tale that way, it would be easy to debunk, wouldn't it? So that's why when people say to you, oh, no, the Bible's just made up fairy tales. This, this is not how you write a fairy tale. You know, if you wanted to write a fairy tale, it'd be long ago in a galaxy far, far away, right? There was a man called Jesus. You know, that's, that's probably how, I think that's how the Mormons is, right? It's like, came from a galaxy far, far away. Um, Acts 26. So it doesn't start off as a fairy tale. It is truly, the Gospels are truly a historical account. Not only that, Jesus... When he was crucified, it was a public event. You know, this was not something done in secret. This is not like the Mormon church where they say, oh, Jesus returned, but it was like secret in the Americas and people go there to try and, you know, the Book of Mormon talks about all these wars that happened over there and they, they go over to the area, they find like no evidence of spears. Or they find like no evidence of it at all. But what happens when you read the Bible, right? People know where Jesus was crucified. They, they, you can go there and do the holy tour and, you know, the, those, the places that he walked, they still exist. You can go there and you can go to Galilee, you can go to Nazareth, you can go to these places. So it's, it's not just a story made up in, in a fictional place. That place still exists. It's just the people there don't believe on the Saviour that came to save them. 
Look at what Paul says when he's trying to convince uh, this noble about Jesus Christ. He says here, having therefore obtained help of God, this is Paul speaking, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. So not only did Jesus die publicly, but the prophets, it, it spoke of these things. You know, it's like when we talk about the birth of Jesus Christ and the wise men came from the east and he, they come to Herod and say, where is Christ to be born? And they say, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. How did they know that? It's because it's already written, right? So it's not that this is a secret, what's going on. It's just people don't believe the scriptures. It says that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the Gentiles, uh, unto the people, unto the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. What is he saying? Paul, you're crazy. Much learning doth make thee mad. So this is mad, crazy, not angry, right? We say, you're so mad. This is mad as in you're nuts, right? But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things. He's saying, hey, you king, you know about this as well. I'm not just making these things up. Before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. You see what he's saying here? See, the, the fact that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. He's saying it's not done in a corner, in a secret place. It was done in public. It was a public trial. Jesus was publicly crucified. Remember we read in John, many came and read the sign. It was written in different languages. So this is not a fairy tale that couldn't be verified. Right? Many people saw Jesus die, even though they did not believe on him. He says, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, ah, oh, the saddest words that somebody can speak, right? Almost. Almost. So he's not saved. Right? He didn't believe. He said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. How sad are those words? That means you, you, you understood you're almost there. You just did not put your faith on Jesus. That's King Agrippa. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. He says, I'm not just want you to be almost saved. I want you to actually be saved. You know, like I am, except, you know, I don't want you to be in jail. <laughs> I don't want you to be bound. That's what he's saying. Except these bonds. So it's public that Christ rose from the dead. Not only that, but the, the witness of him dying, we read this in John 19, lines up with somebody actually being dead. You know, he died on the cross. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath. For that Sabbath day was a high day, but besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. So the fact that Jesus legs were not broken when he was crucified proves that he died on the cross right, so he actually died that's one of the facts and break the legs of the first and the other which was crucified with him i'm sorry if it's hot in here for some reason these just blow out hot air so true but when they came to jesus and saw that he was dead already they break not his legs but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water and he saw it and he that saw it bear record, that's John, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith, that, that he saith true, that you might believe. So that's interesting that Jesus, not only his legs weren't broken, proving that he was dead, but also when they pierced his side, blood and water came out. And that's actually scientific, that I've read. You know, I, I haven't seen it myself. Scientific, that when somebody dies of suffocation, so you'll see if you look up, Crucif uh, crucifixion die by asphyxiation that's basically when you suffocate you run out of oxygen and water and blood pull up around your lungs so when they punctured him in the side blood and water came out so that sort of proved that he, he truly did die uh, from suffocation uh, which is how they would die on the cross because if you don't know how crucifixion works um, if you read about it basically when you're when you're there in order to breathe you have to like pull yourself up so eventually they would run out of energy to be able to, to breathe. So not only was it, was it painful from the seat, but that's not what, it, what would actually kill them. What would actually kill them is they would run out of energy to pull themselves up to breathe and they would suffocate to death. So this is why when the thieves on either side of Jesus Christ were not dead, they broke their legs so that they couldn't use their legs to pull themselves up so that they would die quicker. Um, so they wanted obviously the, these people that were being crucified to die because they didn't want them left up, up there for the Passover. 
Now what's also interesting, and remember we're talking about people saying this is a myth, right? So number one, the Bible is not written like a fairy tale, the, the Gospels. Number two is Jesus Christ actually died. You know, it's, he, it, was a, it, was a, it was a public event. It's not something that just happened in secret. But what's interesting about Jesus Christ as well is that there are actually historians that lived around the time of the early disciples that were not believers that wrote about Jesus. This is why nobody really, if anybody, you know, if anybody says to you, oh, Jesus is just a made up character, they're speaking out of ignorance because nobody disputes the fact that Jesus was a historical figure, that he actually existed. What they're disputing is whether he actually rose from the dead, right? So whether he was who he said he was, but not that he actually lived. This is Josephus. So Josephus was a Jewish historian that lived from this time. So very early on around that time, right? So this is a quote from him. So he's talking about how Herod um, was basically accused of burning down cathedrals and things like that. Uh, of Christian buildings, uh, sorry, Jewish buildings. So he was trying to pin it on the Christians, and that's why he was, um, the Christians were under persecution from Herod. So he says, he hence to suppress the rumor, he falsely, ch he falsely charged with the guilt and punished Christians who were hated for their enormities. Christus, so this is Jesus Christ, the founder of the name, Christians, was put to death, look at this, by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. So you see how you have Jewish historians that are not even believers documenting about Jesus, giving the same timeline as Luke did in Luke 3, right? Because Pontius Pilate was reigning that time in Judea, also during the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Not only that, but Tacitus, who lived at that time, so he would have lived around the time of the disciples as well, just uh, 20 odd years after, he also documented about the death of Jesus Christ, right? So Tacitus was a Roman historian, not a Jewish, Jewish historian. And look at what he says here about Jesus in the early first or second century. At this time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus and his, con his conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. So you see, it's not just the Bible that, that notes that Pilate condemned Jesus, also Josephus and Tacitus. And those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. So you see, Tacitus was aware of what the Christians were preaching. That's why this idea that in the first century, the, you, know, like, you know, you speak to a lot of Muslims in the area, right? They think that Jesus was a Muslim preached Islam and then his disciples preached Islam but you know you have you have I you have testimony of Roman historians not even Christians saying no no there were Christians at the time preaching that he had wrote, risen again after the crucifixion after three days accordingly he was perhaps the Messiah so you see he wasn't a believer he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have recounted wonders so not only Jesus, we have the, 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 the story of Jesus dying in the Bible we also have third-party witnesses that were not believers accounting to it. Another fact of the matter is, is that the tomb was empty. Matthew 28, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, so this is the fact that the tomb was empty and the stone was rolled away, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come unto to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. I'm not 100% sure, but I've read or I've heard somebody talk about the Talmud. The, 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 when they try and explain away Jesus, it basically says that the, the disciples stole him away. So this kind of corroborates with the story that they were trying to make up to say, hey, yeah, the disciples stole away the body and made up that he had rose again from the dead. I'll address that theory in a moment. But what we see, what, what this really proves is that the tomb was empty. Because if, if Jesus' body was actually located, then they could easily put that story to rest. If they were saying, oh, well, the tomb was empty, he was risen again. Oh, no, if it was the wrong tomb, oh, here's his body. Or if somebody, stopped, you know, somebody had the body, it's like, oh, here's his body. No, he didn't rise from the dead. But the fact that they had to conspire 
to, to pay the soldiers and say, hey, the, just say this is why the tomb is empty, actually proves that the tomb actually was empty. Right? So the tomb was empty. So he died publicly. The tomb was empty. And then you have his disciples going out and preaching that he rose again from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, that's the Apostle Peter, then of the twelve, the twelve disciples. After that, this is the most interesting part in this passage, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So you know what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying he was seen by hundreds of people, and you know what? You can go check with them. And you know, a lot of these people, they were willing to die for their faith. So the question is, if Jesus didn't rise again from the dead, what made them willing to go out and tell everyone that he died from, he rose again from the dead? What made them willing to die for that faith? And you say, yeah, well, were they just deceived? Yeah, yeah, you can get deceived if you're just told about, like, you know, let's say, we're, let's say for example, we were deceived, right? We were just told a lie, you know, and we were martyred for our faith. Yeah, a lot of people do that. A lot of people are martyred for what they believe. But the difference with the apostles is they died seeing something. You know what I mean? You, you, die for some, you may die for something you, you believe is true, but you don't die for something you know is false. You, know, you don't risk your life to die for something you know is a lie. Yeah, but this is what these people did. These people died some, for something they saw. If they didn't see it, why were they willing to risk their life? So these are, these are answers people have to come up with. Like if, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, why were so many people willing to die saying that he, they saw him again? They saw him rise from the dead. And not only that, it says here, and last of all, he was seen of me as of one born out of due times, for I am the least of the apostles, this is Paul talking about himself, that I'm not meant to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So this is, this is even stronger evidence that something happened after the death and empty tomb because, yeah, maybe followers of Jesus were so deluded that they died for a lie, but why would enemies of the cross change? You, you know, if, you, if Jesus was your enemy, and you were against Christianity, and you were trying to kill Christians, what would make people that were against Jesus Christ start claiming that they saw Jesus rise from the dead? Does that make sense? Because obviously if you wanted to delude yourself so much that you were willing to die for a lie, which is already unreasonable, what would make somebody who is in opposition to that message from the very beginning to the point where they were killing people preaching that then proclaim, I saw Jesus too? and change. So not only was it like that with Paul, right? So Paul, I'll just skip over Galatians, because we see here that Paul went to see uh, the, the disciples at Jerusalem, and he met James, the Lord's brother. But James also, at the time, did not believe on Jesus. So again, not only do you have Paul, who is in opposition, but James also, the half-brother of Jesus, did not believe on Jesus. What happened to make James then proclaim that Jesus had risen again from the dead? Look at this in John 7. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. What is his brethren saying here? Because at this time, Jesus was not yet publicly declaring himself as the Son of God. And his brethren are kind of egging him on, right? Kind of saying... Yeah, well, you know, you want everyone to know about you. Why don't you go up to the feast and show everyone your works? You know, why, you know, don't you want everyone to know about you? Because they don't understand, right? For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. So you see that there are these facts about Jesus' life. Do they prove the resurrection? Well, no, not scientifically, right? Because you can't take a video camera and see it. The only people that saw him were believers, unless you talk about James and Paul, right? People who were contrary to it, that changed. But we haven't seen Jesus, right? So you can't like prove it scientifically. I can't see you. But there are these facts that need to be explained. Jesus was real. He was a historical figure. He died publicly. This is not a secret. He is accounted of 
in non-Christian sources as well as Christian sources. His tomb was empty. That's why the conspiracies from the Jews even exist. Why would they need to make up the story that the disciples stole the body if his body was still in the tomb? The tomb was empty. And then you have these hundreds of people willing to die proclaiming that they saw the risen Jesus. Not that they were just told that he rose from the dead, that they themselves saw Jesus. This is not how you write a myth, right? So people saying it's a myth, they're just ignorant of what's going on. Number two is the swoon theory. If you don't know what swoon means, it just means you faint, right? So the theory goes like this, that Jesus didn't truly die. That's why I spent most, most of my time on the first one, because that's sort of establishing the facts. The swoon theory goes like this. It says basically that Jesus didn't truly die, but he just fainted and they thought he was dead. And then he was buried and then he just, when he, when he was buried, he just kind of came back, you know, like he was fainted and he, he didn't actually die. And then he came and showed his disciples. In Tim <laughs> now, I don't know if you realize how ridiculous this theory is, but this is, the swoon theory goes, let me just read John 19 to you. It says here, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. So we already read this. Pilate, that he might take the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. So not only do we have the fact that he was publicly killed and they stabbed him and water and blood came out, his legs weren't broken, proving he was dead. We then have his friends, right, taking, I guess, what they thought was the dead body, <laughs> according to the swing theory. And there came also Nicodemus. So if you've forgotten who Nicodemus is, he's the Jew that Jesus went, the Pharisee that Jesus went to in John 3, where he says, tells him you must be born again. Right? So not only Joseph of Arimathea, but Nicodemus also helps with the burial of Jesus in Joseph's tomb that was nearby in that garden. He says he had brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes, with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now, if Jesus didn't die, I mean, Anastasia can probably testify to this. I mean, I don't know what they're doing with this hundred pound of spices. I mean, surely they're putting it in the body and putting it places and everything. And if that body isn't dead, I'm sure that's very uncomfortable for somebody who's still alive and just fainted, right? So not only that is he publicly dies, his body is prepped for burial, right? Wrapped. 100 pound weight of spices and ointment you know so surely they knew this person was dead right and not just fainted and still breathing and just couldn't you know or maybe he's just unconscious for so not only that they took the body they went and they put it in the tomb let's go to matthew 27 when joseph had taken the body wrapped it in clean linen laid it in his own new tomb when he had hewn out in the rock he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed and there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. Now the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that this deceiver said while he was, whilst he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. So they realized what he was preaching. They didn't want them to be able to steal the body and say that he had risen from the dead. Command therefore that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate saith unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So if you didn't know, Joseph of Arimathea, they rolled the stone across, Right, which I'm sure was a pretty big stone that required multiple people to lift. But not only that, the Jews wanted to make sure that the body wasn't stolen. So they put Roman soldiers there to guard the tomb. Now think about what the swoon theory is saying. So the swoon theory, one, number one, is saying Jesus didn't die. Number two, they're saying that he just fainted. So that means Jesus is alive in the tomb, right? Because he's nothing supernatural, right? Because it's just swoon theory. But he wakes up. Somehow, he survives the crucifixion and the whipping and the torture without any medical help for three days and three nights, right? So he's no medical help for three days. And after that, he wakes up and somehow unwraps himself, right? He unwraps himself, puts it. 
Then, in that state, right, he rolls the stone by himself and, and somehow gets past the guards. Now, not only that, right, because he's not, he's, not, he's, not, he's not in his new glorified body, right? So he's still all beaten and bruised. Then he goes to his disciples and says to them, Go, preach that I've risen from the dead. Now, if that sort of Jesus came to you telling you to risk your life that he'd risen from the dead, are you going to go out and preach that he rose again from the dead, that that's our hope? This beaten, bruised, whipped, you know, crucified, half-dead person somehow got out of the grave telling you to go preach that he's your hope of a resurrection? But that's what the swoon theory would have to believe, right, if it was true. So it's pretty crazy. Let's go on to the next one. What about conspiracy? So conspiracy was kind of touched on. Well, what if they stole the body? We have all the same problems of the swoon theory, right? Because if they stole the body, number one, how, how did they roll the stone away without getting past the guards? But the main, thing, the main thing about the swoon theory, so I'm sort of building on this, as you can tell. The main issue with the conspiracy theory is usually when people come up with a conspiracy theory, there's something to gain, isn't there? I mean, you think about the, 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 the secret societies in this world and the conspiracy theories that happen. You know, people even have conspiracy theories about 9-11 and they say like, oh, you know, maybe they, it was an insurance claim. I've even heard like things about the Titanic, right? I don't know if you've ever watched documentary, documentaries about the Titanic and, you know, we're told that it was just a tragic event and that they, uh, that they hit an iceberg. I don't know which one's true, right? But people believe that there was a conspiracy that it was actually, they sunk that boat on purpose in order to get the insurance claim and all that sort of stuff. But if you watch it on YouTube, you can, you can look up these you know, real stories of Titanic. But my point is with a conspiracy, generally when you have a conspiracy, there's something to gain, isn't there? You know, and with, with, I guess with men in, in power, it would be one of three things. Either it's women, you know, sex, money, maybe there's money to gain, or there's power to gain. There's some sort of authority to gain. But who's gonna get together and conspire a story with nothing to gain at all and only your life to lose, right? As I was, I was talking with some Muslims recently and I was trying to say to them, look, let's say we got together and we wanted to just make up this story, right? We're going to make up this conspiracy just to like glorify Jesus and all it got us was death. Why, why would we want to conspire to make up that story? You know, unless, it was, unless we actually believed it happened. We, you know, because cons conspiracy, we're talking about people that are actually trying to deceive people now. Not that they believed it happened and they were sincerely wrong. This is people, they know it's a lie, but they're going to conspire to spread this lie with nothing to gain. Right? That's what you'd have to believe if the conspiracy theory is true. Now look at what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. He says here, and this is a resurrection chapter, right? This is about Jesus rising again. And he says, well, if Jesus didn't rise again, our faith is vain. He says here as well, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? Look at this. And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? He's saying, if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, why am I going through all this trouble? Why, why, why bother going through it all? He says, why stand we in trouble, jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of man I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. So he says, he's all the, the, the opposition he has to face. What advantage hath it me if the dead rise not? He's saying, what's the point? There's no, why am I going all this? Why, why go to all this trouble? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. He says, you know what? Because if the resurrection is not true, I might as well just enjoy my life. I've got better things to do than to die daily for Jesus Christ and to fight with beasts at Ephesus and be in jeopardy every hour. If it's not true, why, why would I go through all this? So you see, he's got nothing to gain um, besides a better resurrection, right? Hebrews 11, we learned last week, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Why? That they might obtain a better resurrection. So you see, so there was something else in it for them just then, the women, the money, and the power. So there was no reason to conspire to make it up. And in fact, Paul says if it was true, he would have better things to do. He would have other things to do that he would rather be doing. Now, what about a deception? Deception, or like the cult theory, right? 
Because this is like one, well, this, is, this is one of my people I, as, as well, you know, because obviously when people use these theories, they're not always cognizant of the facts around Jesus. And people will say, surely you've heard people say things like, yeah, well, you know, I could just tell people I'm the savior and convince people, you know, like Jim Jones, I can just be a cult leader, convince people to follow me, you know, be charismatic enough, get them to drink some Kool-Aid, poison Kool-Aid, we all go to heaven together, right? So people will say things like that. Now, the reason why that doesn't hold water is because people don't actually realize what Jesus is claiming. Because cult leaders that die stay dead. Cult leaders don't tell their followers, you know what, you're going to see me die and then you're going to see me rise again. And then prove it. And you know what, if a cult leader does that, you probably should follow them. <laughs> right? If a leader of a religion says, you know what, I'm God in the flesh, to prove it to you, I'm going to die publicly, you're going to bury me three days later you're going to see me rise again i'm going to eat with you you probably should believe that person yeah, that's 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 probably the person you should, that's the man you should be following right but it's not just like your jim jones cult right because jesus he actually told his disciples what was going to happen he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days, rise again. So you see how it's not just as easy as just, you know, manipulating people into believing your Jesus on earth, and then, you know, then you start marrying all their wives and sleeping with their wives, and as a lot of cults do. Jesus' claims were very different. And not only that, he rose from the dead. And what they were claiming was not just that he was the Messiah dead and disappeared. He was the Messiah that had risen and they had seen him. Now, what's another one? So you see, I'm going through these a bit faster. So I'm, I'm, I'm almost done getting to number six. Another theory is the hallucination theory. The hallucination theory is that they just all saw a vision. They didn't actually see Jesus. Now, <laughs> some people take this hallucination theory too far, right? In the sense that I've heard people, I was, I was listening to a Joe Rogan podcast recently, and he was saying that some people believe that when Moses saw the burning bush, that there was some chemical in that bush and that he was just having like a psychotropic experience. That he was just like, you know, imagine, you know, he, he was just basically drugged up and high and just thinking that he was talking with God. But even that theory is silly, right? Because it's like people don't know these stories that happen in the Bible. I mean, if Moses was just tripping and he was just high and thought that he spoke to God, then, then how did he do all those miracles in Egypt? You know, remember the Passover? Remember the parting of the Red Sea? These are all huge public things that were done in front of millions of people. I don't think a burning bush that was just drugs is enough to explain that. Right? So that, it's like with the hallucination theory. It's like people think, you know, when Jesus appeared to them in John 20, do people honestly think that the disciples we're just sitting around smoking a peace pipe together and just like hallucinating Jesus? Is that the... Because that's what you'd have to believe in order to think that it's some sort of drug-induced um, hallucination. Because I know there are theories out there where people, you know, take certain drugs and they all experience the same thing. But is, is that what people are going to say the disciples were doing? You know, after they were, you know, they were following Jesus, you know, they were scared, so they just got together in a room and just, you know, smoked some drug together to have this experience. You yeah. know? But not only that, it, you know, Jesus appeared in multiple places, right, to multiple people. So that wouldn't even fit either. Not only that, but Jesus actually ate with them. So we see in Luke 24 that the, the, the testimony of the disciples is not just that they saw Jesus, but they actually shared a meal with him. And as they spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and I suppose that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me to have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. So not only do they claim that they saw him physically, they touched him. They ate with him. Jesus appeared in multiple places. 
But also with her, her, her hallucinations, generally they're quite unique, right? Where one person will hallucinate, they'll see one thing. Another person will hallucinate, they'll see something different. So if you were to gather all these testimonies <laughs> together of this hallucination, sorry, we did balloon animals this morning in Bible club. If you were to gather all these hallucinations together, you would get conflicting testimonies, won't you? But no, these people, when they saw Jesus, they all saw the same thing. So it's very unreasonable that if you say, yeah, somebody might have hallucinated because they wanted to see Jesus so much, but not hundreds of people. Hundreds of people don't hallucinate the exact same thing at the exact same time, right? For it to be a hallucination. Now the last one I want to cover with you, and it's not generally covered by Christian circles, but this is the Muslim example. This is the Muslim theory, right? That Jesus was replaced on the cross. And they'll say that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. And, this, and the, if you didn't know, the Quran actually teaches this. So that's why I find it so misleading when Muslims tell you, hey, we believe in Jesus. You know, when you go to their door and you say, hey, I'm here to share the gospel, they say, hey, we believe in Jesus. We believe in the Bible. I find that the most like, misleading and deceptive way to talk to Christians because they know full well that they don't believe the Bible as we have it today. And they know full well that we believe Jesus, the Son of God, and rose again from the dead. Yet they have the audacity to say, you know, they believe in Jesus. It'd be like saying, yeah, we believe in Muhammad, but Muhammad was actually like, you know, Abraham or something. You know, just being disingenuous about who he is or who we know that they think he is. You know, like if we said we believe in Muhammad, but there was some other Muhammad that we believed in that kind of lined up with the Bible, there isn't. But that would be disingenuous, knowing what you know Muslims believe about Muhammad, that he's the last prophet. So they'll say things like that. But because they have to reject the resurrection and the fact that he was the son of God, they, in the, in the Quran, Muhammad taught that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, that he went to the cross, but he was replaced with somebody that looked like him. And it was actually somebody else that died on the cross. And after he died, I don't know what the truth, I don't know what they actually teach about what happened afterwards. Because I was talking to some Muslims and I was saying, I was asking, like, did he appear to them afterwards? You know, because if Jesus was saved, from the cross, that means he was still with the disciples, right? Before he ascended to heaven. So here, here it is in Surah 4. So this is in the Quran. It says, And for their saying, indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. So that's saying that the Christians are saying that, right? That, that Jesus was killed. It says, They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. So you see how the Quran actually rejects not only the death of Jesus, the Quran rejects the crucifixion of Jesus, right? But another was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption. And they did not kill him for certain. So the Quran is very clear that Jesus did not die on the cross. Jesus did not rise again from the dead. So the question is, because Christianity is based on the resurrection. This is what I ask Muslims. Does that mean Allah started Christianity? Because if Allah was the one that made the Christians think that Jesus died, Allah was the one that started it, if he didn't correct it. Like if, if, if Allah swapped him out, why didn't Allah tell the, his followers that no, 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 that's not Jesus on the cross. If Jesus was saved from going to the cross and he was saved from death and he's with his disciples, why didn't he tell them, guys, that's not me on the cross, right? Because doesn't that make sense that that's what it would stop them from spreading this false religion that's constantly at, at end with Christianity. So if that's what happened, then Allah would have started Christianity. But not only that, they misunderstand that we, see the disciples didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead just because he died and the tomb was empty. Right? Because if he died and the tomb was empty and that was it, they would have been left wondering. But the reason why they were willing to risk their lives and go out and preach that he had risen from the dead because Jesus appeared to them. So the question is, if Jesus didn't die on the cross and didn't appear to them to tell them, hey guys, it's not me, and the guy that died on the cross didn't come back to tell them, hey, that wasn't Jesus, that was me on the cross, and he disappeared somewhere, then who was it that appeared to them? Who appeared to them and ate with them? Who did they all see that they were all willing to die? in order to say that Jesus had risen from the dead. Now, not only that, they'll say, yeah, but it's because 
Christians want to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, so that's why the church just continues to promote this to sort of control them and keep them deceived and things like that. Yeah, well, that would explain Christians later on, right? So maybe in the 200s and 300s, maybe you have the, they, they can say, oh, the Catholic Church came along and took that popular narrative from the Christians to try and control them and to organize religion and keep them under control and everything like that. But that wouldn't explain how it all started. Because where did it start? Why were Christians believing it in the first place in order to use it to control them and to get them on board? You see? So it falls very short as well. And that's why they have to reject the crucifixion. But if they do, then they do not have a good explanation of the facts either. Anyway, so I'll end it there. I'll just end it on one more passage. So I hope today is giving you a lot of information about the resurrection. You know, I, I, I know different people are driven by different things. But me, myself, I love to know that my faith is reasonable. I don't have to leave my brain at the door when I put my faith on Jesus Christ. I can put my faith on Jesus Christ, look at the facts and know that we have the most reasonable explanation of the facts. And that is the fact that Jesus indeed is the Son of God and that he rose again from the dead. And this is why Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, you know, the fact that he has, he has uh, confidence in this resurrection we also, looking to the testimony of the apostles, can have that confidence, knowing that in our spiritual life, that when Jesus overcame death, he overcame hell, we also have the victory in our faith. 1 Corinthians 15. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know, look at this, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. See, because if Christ be not risen, our faith is, is vain. But you see, our faith is not vain because he did rise from the dead. Thank God for that. All right, I hope that was a blessing to you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that you rose again with many infallible proofs as we read about in Acts. Lord, um, just looking at the evidence, um, you know, people, people don't believe because... People don't not believe because of lack of evidence. They don't believe just because they don't want you as their saviour for whatever reason, Lord. So I just pray that you help us as Christians on this earth now, trying to convince others to believe on Jesus. Help us to have a good knowledge of the things of the Bible, especially of the resurrection, Lord. Powerful testimony to know that many of the other theories about Jesus fall short and the only reasonable theory left is that he truly was the Son of God that died on a cross and rose again. Thank you, Lord, for doing that for us. And we just pray that as you leave us here on this earth, I pray that you'd help us to be faithful witnesses as the apostles were for you. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.